You promised you'd take me there again someday. James! <sighs> to our special place. Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, this game's still hanging with me, man. I am down horrendously bad. It was one of the saddest games I think I've ever played, but wow, did I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, I swear I didn't know anything heading into this week. A lot of people were sussing out my first time playthrough of Silent Hill 2 going, why now? Why the week that this event for Silent Hill is going to happen that was just recently announced and it's happening today as we upload this video? I swear I didn't know. We plan out our content a month ahead of time each month for Retro Rebound. So when I start October's content, it's towards the end of September. It just worked out that way. We're feeling pretty blessed. But what I want to do is a little bit different from our typical So I Played for the First Time videos. For those new here, I spoil the hell out of the game. We're still going to do that. But before we get into that, I want to do a full non-spoiler section of the video because this is a tremendous video game. It is a special video game. And after completing it, for better or for worse, I suppose, I totally get the claims that people wanted this game remade. And I have so many thoughts, so many feelings I want to share. But if there's anything I can do, it's give this game a ringing endorsement. It is fantastic, thoughtful, thematic, and everything you ever see throughout the game all has purpose, all has meaning behind it. And I love symbolism in video games. I think it's used a lot in Japanese game design, but outside of that, I think it's criminally underutilized. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, if you're new here, you're into retrospective and nostalgic content, you're in the right place, consider subscribing. Let me know if you want me to take the dive into Silent Hill 3. Uh, beware, I am the easiest target for horror games, and this was a big deal for me. Actually playing and being this game, this was a big deal. That's because the fear factor here is tolerable. Like, you can do it. If you are like me and you get scared easily, the first hour, is pretty agonizing as you learn the tricks and things that they do to get you on edge. But as you adjust and you start to set into a little rhythm, you can do it. Trust me, and the game's not too long. It took me about six hours to finish. Now, as always in Retro Rebound tradition, the complete inbox experience. Of course, yes, even Silent Hill 2 bought this game for PS2. You're probably looking at this going, Maddie, black label for Silent Hill 2? No. Joke is on you. We got the greatest hits disc. Trust me. Just y'all know how I feel about the uniform collection. We cannot have a red label on all my black label shelves. Okay. Anyway, let's get into the complete and box experience. Then we'll talk about the game in non-spoiler fashion, and then we'll spoil it, and I'll let you know when that is. The silence is broken. James Sunderland's life is shattered when his wife, Mary, suffers a tragic death. Three years later, a mysterious letter arrives from Mary, beckoning him to return to their sanctuary of memories, the realm of Silent Hill. Now, James must go back to that special place to uncover the truth, unaware that the answers he seeks requires the ultimate sacrifice. Return to Silent Hill in an entirely new adventure with all new characters and monsters. Battle horrifying creatures with a new arsenal of weapons and items. Riveting story Line, stunning graphics and true-to-life CG movies leave you on the edge of your seat. Atmospheric lighting and ambient 3D surround sound shift and change at every terrifying turn. Dynamic camera angles, beautifully rendered environments, and real-time weather effects deliver a cinematic horror experience. Yes, the, you know, the, the fog and all that stuff that this entry is famously known for. All right, so as I said, you have the greatest hits disc on the right. You want that because it comes with a bunch of bonus content like the sub scenario. It comes with some new weapons, all that stuff. So make sure you play the greatest hits version if you're looking to go into the OG. That's where all the content lies. Now, let's take a look at this manual. We're here on the back. You'll see this was a year for Konami, right? They published this game and then they published Sons of Liberty the same year, and this is my personal favorite Metal Gear, so I would have been eating good if I was an adult back then, but I was, uh, let's see here. I was six at the time, so I was not coming near any of these adult-focused video games. All right, cracking it open. Uh, this is a fantastic manual, very artsy and thematic like the rest of the game. We go past the controls, and we get into the prologue of the game where it talks a bit about uh, James Sunderland's wife became seriously ill and passed away. James tried to pull himself together and resume his life after the loss, but struggled to get back on his feet. The emotional pain and emptiness left James in a constant state of mourning. I feel like this gives more context in the back of the box, so it is a worthwhile read. I, I love the picture-in-pictures here that you're seeing. It's kind of torn up, very bloody. 
Here they have the main menu, small walkthrough of that, but nothing complex, nothing stand out. What I love is as we get into the game a little bit more, the character profiles here. What I love is they define James Sunderland occupation protagonist. That's his job in life. He is the protagonist. <laughs> I always thought that was funny, but they walk you through all the important characters you meet. Angela Roscoe, I believe she is around 19 or something like that. At least that's what I had read online, but it's not said here in the manual. She's one of the first characters you meet in the game. Maria, probably the most important character in the game. Laura, the most annoying character in the game. Eddie, feel bad for Eddie, man. And then here they walk you through using items and all that stuff because uh, this was uh, tank control, so they had to make sure you knew how to play such a obtuse style of video game. Uh, there are hints here in the back of the manual for a search view by holding L2. I actually didn't know this until I beat the game, but yes, turning off your light can help you avoid confrontations with some enemies, but that means you have to run in the dark, and I took my chances elsewhere. I was not going to do that. I'm not that ballsy. Uh, they talk about the radio here and how the white noise will change depending on the monster, the number of them, and the distance, which I think is a great feature, and uh, the weapons. He's just, you know, they mention even here, James is an ordinary man with no special weapons training so his skill is marginal and you can feel that for sure i think they lean into the tank controls a lot in a way that makes sense but that's what we have here it says some fear death others pray for it silent hill 2 that'd be a great poster by the way but that is what comes in a complete box copy of silent hill 2 this is over a hundred dollars not cheap to find but happy to invest in it have it in my collection uh, especially with the greatest hits disc when it came with the copy uh, that was the perfect storm for me but now let's get into the non-spoiler version of why i like silent hill 2 a lot. All right, so I'm very transparent about my battles with anxiety. Uh, I am a hypochondriac. I've been trying to fight that war since probably like 2015. And this game's focus on illness, death, coping with death, it hit really tremendously hard. And I love these types of video games. These are what I call truly transformative experiences. It reminds me a bit of how I felt after I finished Persona 5 Royal, a game that really changed me as well. And a game before that I can think of as Gone Home, another game that changed me. There's that really strong feeling when a, a, a creative experience connects with you on that level. And this was a different type of change. It helped me understand things about myself in a really weird way uh, because I didn't feel alone with some of those thoughts. Um, not that I particularly struggled with them as much as I used to, but it was almost reaffirming to play this relic from the past that came out in 2001 and go, oh wow, this was a thing then. It's not like this new mental battle I just suddenly started waging and it felt I don't know, like you could deal with it, you could fight back, and this game is loaded with symbolism. So there's never really a moment in the game they're directly telling you something outside of what I think is the end of the game where they very clearly tell you something that's going on. We'll get into that. But uh, for me, what I love was watching people's thoughts and what they took away from it versus what I took away from it. And for me, it was a oddly comforting tale um, of someone struggling clearly with depression and how they fought their demons and other people fighting their demons and what they've been through, a uh, perspective on how bad your demons can be, all that stuff. So I was very surprised because for those who don't know, I walked into Silent Hill 2 knowing nothing about it. I didn't. I just knew it was a scary game. That's all I thought it was, like a, just a really scary game. But what I didn't expect was this trip through the mind, this trip through mental health and a lot of symbolism surrounding it. But it's an incredibly thoughtful experience. I will say for as thoughtful as it is and as gripped as I was by the story, thank God that story existed. This is my first time playing with tank controls as well. I've never played any of the OG Resident Evil games. I wanted to go back and play Resident Evil 2, 3, uh, that kind of stuff, but I never got around to it. And then the remakes came out and, and I thought those were great. So I played those, although I've heard mixed things about 3 remake versus the original 3, but you can let me know about that more in the comments down below. Uh, but for me, I just never got around to experiencing tank controls. So this is my first time with that. That was a tough adjustment. I mean, you'll see in some of the gameplay as we progressively go through the game, I get better, but there was definitely like a moment of, I don't know if I can get through this. I'm really struggling with reorienting my character and holding my analog stick to the right, but James is going to the left. I don't think I ever truly got used to it. I just learned how to deal with it. Uh, perhaps thematic as well. The, the toughness of the controllers transcends the experience. Um, but yeah, I, I really had a tough time with it. But what held me into that gameplay 
was the the creative mechanics like the radio we read about it in the manual i love the radio because when you're walking toward the camera in a dark hallway or a dimly lit hallway because of your flashlight and all you hear is the from the radio you're like oh no someone's in here with me and i can't see them and i can't rotate the camera it's in that moment there that you go does this need to be remade because there is that oh this actually works really well with tank controls and with these set camera angles but at the same time, I feel if this game played incredibly well, like we had a Resident Evil 2 style gameplay system with still the same mental health focus, the dread of the original Silent Hill 2, which is a very tough line to walk, we could have the very best game in the survival horror genre. I know that's already the case for many of you, but I just can't fully commit to that yet because of the gameplay like if we're talking story like to me it's right there with dead space and dead space for those who don't know is my favorite survival horror series i love dead space so much for me to say this about silent hill is probably the biggest compliment i can give it i also want to talk about graphics this game visually is beautiful environmentally the amount of assets here is truly impressive for its time like when i walked into the bowling alley or i think it's called heaven's night the bar and you just see all the little, you know, the glasses or in the bowling alley, you see just like a tipped over bookshelf with some bowling alley or some bowling balls. You see pizza, you see like just the remnants of a society. Uh, it, it reminded me a bit of Fallout and why I love those games, which is a story is told through the environment. You see how things are laid out and you wonder what was happening before everyone seemingly vanished. At least that was my interpretation going into it. Uh, but again, the visuals here uh, in the CG movies, in the cutscenes, how well directed they were with the camera angles. Uh, this game is really, really impressive. On a storytelling front, it holds up in every single regard. It's just the gameplay is very much a product of its time. I will say you can work through it, but there hasn't been anyone that I've talked to who have played this game recently. I got uh, my good friend Jimmy Champagne into this, who's a big horror guy, and he's like, this is awesome, but those controls, though. Same thing with my buddy Paul. He's the one who told me to play this um, this month when we were planning content, and he was saying, yeah, it's it doesn't control well. So that's like my general warning alongside everyone else. I can't make any type of defense for the gameplay, actually how it feels, but its systems are good. Just all in all, if you were curious about this game, I think it's worth a try. I know they wanted no HUD because it does create that immersive experience, that dread, that horror, and I like that. But it kind of didn't work because I was always popping open my menu to just change my weapons, reload my weapon because it was quicker that way, or to use the map. And so eventually you're breaking yourself out of the experience constantly anyway. I hope this is something they figure out in like a potential remake again as we record this video. I don't know if that's something that's going to be announced, but it's certainly been leaked and rumored for long enough that I imagine it will be happening. Uh, but I would love to have it where you just had a quick way to look at a map and go, okay, I see where I am now. I just That orientation, or rather disorientation, consistently screwed with me in my playthroughs. Some of the puzzles, the riddles in this game, I did it on normal difficulty. Some were easier, like the noose puzzle. That was a little easier to figure out, but some are just like, how did I know to use the orange juice here at the shoot in the apartment section to knock down a key? I just, sometimes it's just like, what, what was that, man? How was I supposed to know that? But it's a very strange game, and I feel like all these weird things I'm talking about almost complement the experience. Uh, and I think some people love it because of its obtuse nature, and that's totally okay. Uh, so that's really what I wanted to say in a non-spoiler fashion, and we'll get deeper into the gameplay mechanics and the story now. So if you have watched this far and you're looking for your time to know, like, oh, it's going to get spoiled, this is it. This is what we typically do in Retro Rebound fashion, where we, we just go from top to bottom and summarize the whole story, and I just give my thoughts beat for beat. So now, let's begin. As I mentioned, you are James Sunderland. You're here at Silent Hill. You're looking for your wife, Mary, after receiving a letter from her, even though she was dead three years ago. The first sus alert I got was when they called this their special place. And the music hums in the background, which this soundtrack is freaking god tier. Oh my god. Dude. Oh, just... I almost feel bad using in the video, but just in combination with the environment and the camera angles this is a masterful soundtrack which i did hear a lot of going into this game but wow we this is fire okay anyway while you're walking around my first sus alert was the save system he talked about a 
clawing in his head. You know, something was wrong. And when he said that, I went, okay, this immediately, that was the first sign to me that this is some type of mental trip. Like, okay, why is the save system telling me something's up here? Why is it just a red piece of paper? And quite honestly, I don't think I ever got the answer to that. But that to me was symbolizing like something's going on in James's head. So you get to eventually the cemetery, funny enough, where everything comes full circle, depending on the ending you get. The ending I got comes full circle to that cemetery, which is technically the best ending. It's there you meet Angela Orozco. So she says she is there for her mother, her mama. However, she warns you that something is wrong with this town. What I found interesting during this encounter was my initial interpretation was James is just trying to pretend Excuse to be brave. <laughs> but as I thought about it more once I finished the game, it's almost like here when James is going, I don't care, whatever, that he is kind of like suicidal in a way. He just doesn't care what happens to him. He's in a really dark place, hence that's what Silent Hill represents. It calls people in to face their demons. And so upon watching some of the footage back, my interpretation of that event changed. And I think that happened for a lot of people. You know, you go through the first time, you're, you're learning everything. And this game does have new endings that even appear in a second playthrough and new options you can access in a second playthrough. So it's definitely a worthwhile double dip. Um, where I think your interpretation will shift and your understanding will certainly grow with the game. But Angela is one of the most tragic characters in this game. But the way I was crawling through this experience at first was like, okay, how does Angela tie to James? Or when you meet Eddie and Laura, how do these characters tie to James? Are they his family? Are they his best friends? Reincarnate? Like the, the theories going through my head now in hindsight were pretty wild. When it turns out these were just other people come into Silent Hill to face their demons. I think knowing that, that's where my lack of knowledge, I love to go in as blind as possible for those who don't know, but I think that's where my lack of knowledge did play against me. Because if I was able to read the situation better, I, I do feel I would have caught on to more of the signs happening between Angela, Eddie, Laura, and what their stories were. But I was always looking at it from the angle of like, how does this connect back to James? And in a way it does, like the things that they say to them in particular, are, are very telling of James's current disposition and how he truly feels about Mary and the situation with his wife that he's hiding from himself. But certainly going through it, my, my view of things had shifted over time and I realized I had a misunderstanding of what Silent Hill as a location was truly doing and the people it was calling in. So continuing on the story, I really got another sus alert here with the environmental storytelling when I saw bullets on the floor in the room, you get your handgun, but in particular, there was a dead body. It's like the first and only jump scare of the game is when you're walking down an alley, there's a van to your left and this straight jacket monster just slides out from under it. It was the one time I went like, oh, and really jumped, but as you get closer to this body, it was James's outfit. And I was very interested in that as well. I don't know if anyone caught that, but I don't know if that was missed or if it was just, you know, reusing assets in a smart way. But when I saw that, I went, is James actually dead? Does this symbolize something here? That, that was the constant question of the game. Does this symbolize something? What does this mean? And you just have that all throughout from the newspapers to the audio and the shift in in tone like specifically angela i don't mean to leap to the end of the game here but when you find her in the staircase and it's just on fire and she's like mama it's you and she's like grabbing your face like, i haven't seen you in a while and she goes wait you're not mama and then she asks you to take care of her and then she walks up the stairs and talks about her own personal hell and talks about how you don't like really, really care about mary the way you say you do it's this all over the place feeling and so that's why i was always constantly thinking like what does this symbolize and how does it connect to james but you realize it's these other characters own personal tales being told and there are a lot of hints peppered throughout so eventually you make your way to the apartment buildings and uh oh goodness gracious man like i was tweaking out in here especially when you're walking down the hallway and you see your man pyramid head behind the bars just watching you and it's in that moment there you go this man is in the building and I don't know where he is now because he walked back out into the hallway he's gone he's gone you're like oh 
Okay, okay. So, uh, Pyramid Head, hey, um, where'd you go? I, so, again, I, I only know Pyramid Head. You want to know my first encounter with Pyramid Head? It was a Fallout 3 mod that I downloaded for a stream on Twitch when I had, like, 30,000 subscribers on Mr. Maddie Plays. Like, it was a very long time ago. That was my only encounter with Pyramid Head because it was a... Octo Funny enough, we're kind of doing the same thing here. We're playing horror games in October or, or survival horror games. And, uh... <laughs> And I download this mod for October content, but uh, that was my only encounter with Pyramid Head So I got a weird flashback there, but I saw him and went, okay That's that guy. Okay. That's that's who it is. That's where he's from. Okay Like I said completely blind because I'm not a horror person. So going into this. I was like, I don't really I'm okay I, I don't like to be scared. I'm fine. Okay, so you know, you're being stalked throughout the building Your first encounter with Pyramid Head is very symbolic of where James is at uh, this game talks a lot about James's sexual frustrations. You learn that through the enemy design of the nurses whose faces are like completely covered, but they have these very nice outfits on. They're very curvy. Or, of course, Pyramid Head being what I believe was a representation of James's guilt, kind of following him around and pushing him around. And eventually he has to fight back against it and, and own his guilt and own the situation by taking out Pyramid Head where they eventually impale themselves and say like okay we did our job um but when you find them is it's a very sexual cutscene like he's kind of hitting it um in the kitchen um and i remember seeing that and going like what what is going on here and it's funny because again this game cemented its weirdness when james unloads a whole clip from the closet into pyramid head and the game just has you like walk out walk into the hallway and he's not there that that's not traditional monster creeping around the hallways following you and i think to myself is it because it's an old game like do they just reset where pyramid head is at but when you think about the instances that he shows up and how he helps you progress throughout the game it starts to make sense like when you fight him in your first boss in the in the apartment buildings and he walks away and lowers the water from the building so you can go down the stairs and follow him, pretty much. It's one of those things where you go, well, that's not a villainous thing to do. Wouldn't you just run away? And especially because when you beat him, he doesn't take a knee and go like, oh, I'll be back. He just walks away. It's almost like you fought off your guilt and you're going to keep going to try to find Mary until the guilt comes back again. And it's arisen by certain characters, such as when you're running through these very claustrophobic hallways and here comes here comes pyramid head while you're with Mar maria and he kills her again and keeps killing her again to remind you of the guilt you experienced because james killed his wife mary it's again so masterfully done when you start to put the things together but what i couldn't help but feel is that this is the issue with symbolism and i think any any medium is you can really hand wave away a lot of criticism by going oh it's it's symbolic you just you didn't understand it i do think sometimes and this is my personal belief as a creative that when we have something symbolic there is a gentle way to sort of point it out if you point it out gently and they still don't notice it that's not on you anymore but i do think a lot of the conclusions that were drawn from this game were following interviews breakdowns from developers and everyone was sort of in the dark on what this game was actually trying to deliver. Some of it's clear, but I couldn't tell you straight up that like I took away this thing with the straight jackets and the nurses until the tail end of the game. And I started to recognize a couple of trends, but then I started reading online and went, okay, that makes more sense because the developers said it. So I think if we're looking at it in a, in a box, that Silent Hill's symbolism is very strong, but it definitely had to be pointed out two players and that grew the appreciation for sure so it's, i'm not going to pretend it doesn't exist but it's something that individually i think the game does struggle with from time to time things that are more direct are things like angela's story which you'll notice a little bit more i think around your second playthrough but let's continue on so you're obviously here in the apartment building and this is where you meet eddie as well he's puking his brains out and then he goes and starts claiming innocence and then he says he doesn't know who Pyramid Head is. Again, that strangeness to this game. Why? What do you mean you're innocent, dude? What are you talking about? Like, who are you saying you killed? 
obviously he's fighting his demons because it is said that he murdered someone by the end of the game. He murdered a dog. It's insinuated that he may have killed the person who bullied him. And you're like, okay, now seeing that encounter makes a little bit more sense. Everyone's out here fighting their demons. Uh, so it continues to be a fascinating game when you look back in hindsight. But here, I'm just trying to piece things together. What is going on? Afterwards, you're going to find Angela. And this is where I think her story in particular is gripping because she asks if you're afraid and offers you the knife because she's afraid of what she's going to do to herself. Since you saw her last time, she's just looking for her mom. And now you can tell she's struggling with depression and she's ready to commit suicide. Um, again, a really hard hitting moment and then freaks out when you're reaching for the knife and says, sorry, I've been bad. Please don't indicating signs of some type of abuse, which is cemented in her boss fight, which we will get into later in the game. But these are all planting the breadcrumbs. You find Laura and she kicks the key away from you because heaven forbid she's helpful. But given her connection to Mary, um, she's just kind of fighting you the whole game. And you think, oh, okay, why are you doing this, Laura? You. Why? In this you, funny, it? weird voice acting that I don't think was that bad, by the way. I see a lot of people critique the voice acting for the game. I kind of liked it. I didn't think it was too bad. There's a, a delivery here or there that's very Shenmue-esque with James where I'm thinking, could have punched it a little harder. But you can't tell me the voice acting's bad when you read that letter at the end of the game from Mary. I mean, you just can't. Like, that was so gut-wrenching. But anyway, Laura's running around, and little do you know, she's pure, she's fine. She's, it's a quiet town for her. There's no, you know, straight jackets, nurses. She's just chilling, having a good time, messing with you, inhibiting your progress frustratingly. Soon after, you're going to meet Maria, and she's going to join you. This is where now you have James's guilt being pyramid head. And then you have what I think is like James's desires, like manifested as Maria. So, she, you know, cause he, like when he sees her, you look just like her, but obviously like you can see the little tattoo, you can see the curvy dress, the way she flirts with him, the way she's very supportive of him. Certain things she says at very particular moments, it's almost like it's what James wants to hear. Like when she catches up with him out of nowhere, in the basement of all places. And she's like, you're supposed to be protecting me. It's almost like he wanted that type of love and demand from her, but not the venomosity that came with Mary. So like Maria is this manifested desire of James. So now you have his desires and his guilt and he sort of has to push past all of them. What I didn't know until the end of the game and I don't know how in the world you do it with these tank controls, especially because you can kill Maria on your own, by the way, by like just accidentally shooting her in combat or doing damage to her. But if Maria takes any damage in the game, you can't get her ending. Now, I kind of like this because if it were easy to get that ending and you did end up with that and you hear her like <laughs> coughing at the end of her ending, you're like, oh, the cycle's about to repeat. That's not good. I think that would be very disappointing for the players. So the way they made the, I think it's called the return ending, um, which is the one where you go back to the graveyard with Laura. Um, the fact that they made that the easiest to get was a smart call. But anyway, Maria's here. I think she's a manifestation of James's desires. And so now they're venturing together. This is where the game gets a little less scary. I just got someone with me. I don't know. She's not going to fight, but I have someone with me. And that's nice. It's a nice feeling. And I think that works really well because it's effective to me in saying, this is maybe what James feels. He's not alone now, he's comforted. And when she's gone, when she decides to, for example, lay down in the hospital by herself, you're like, okay, I guess I'm just gonna go by myself now. It's like, man, I just want a little company for the ride. So I don't know if that was intentional, but that's something I personally took away from it. So speaking of the hospital, uh, yeah, like I said, Maria is going to rest in a random bed here on the third floor. It's like, okay, but she's gone when I come back in the room to save. Okay. And when I find her room in the other side, there's breathing and pills, but no one's there. This is like a small little detail, small detail that I feel you can easily miss. But when you hear that breathing, what this is a room where she's supposed to be why isn't she here and it really captures that you're on the other side now and that's further emphasized when you go outside 
and it's no longer foggy, which I personally felt right from the get-go. Like, I started the game and went, this definitely symbolizes the fog of the mind, because you just can't see. Like, a lot of people go, oh, it's atmospheric, I love it, but I'm, I can't even see two steps in front of me, dude. Uh, so, to me, I wasn't head over heels in the fog, but I love the darkness. When it got dark out, um, maybe it's because I knew what it was like with the fog versus the darkness, but I like that a lot more because seeing in the distance a mannequin take shape and you go, oh, whoa, stop, stop. For me, this game hit hard when it was dark. But of course, that also symbolized to me that like James is now in the dark, you know? And so I, I, I love how it plays with the visual effects, but uh, the, 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 the fog was hit or miss for me, which I know is an uncommon take. I just, I felt it wasn't symbolizing what fog did. It just felt like a wall in front of me. And I think you could have fog and allow me to sort of see like at least two more steps in front of me. That would have been really, really nice. But I know it's not a common thought. People love the fog. And I think, again, the fog is great. Just a little, little more visibility. But as many people have said in the past, a tech trick so that they could have uh, these open levels. And speaking of which, one thing that would be really cool to see, again, I'm, I'm making this, if there's ever a Silent Hill 2 remake and we know what's in it, I don't know at this moment in time, but if they were to do a remake, I want to explore more of Silent Hill. I want to go inside buildings, see other people's stories, remnants of the society that was here once. I want to have that kind of experience. Like I, want to, I don't want to turn into an open world game necessarily, but I think the unmarked, off-the-beaten-track exploration could be really cool for this game. Again, I don't mind its linearity, just when you're roaming from street to street and you're using the map, I would just love to go inside some of these houses and see what's going on. Obviously, scavenge for more materials. I feel like that would be a natural exploration of the ideas that are kind of planted here in the base game. Anyway, let's go back to the story here. So... You meet with Laura in the patient wing here inside the hospital. And this is after, by the way, Pyramid Head scared the life out of me and pushed me off a rooftop. But then Laura says she had actually met Mary. So you start scratching your head thinking like, okay, well, what's going on here? But this was last year in the hospital, even though Mary was apparently already dead three years ago. So how is that possible? So she says, I want to go grab a letter from Mary and... You know, James foolishly believes her and stumbles into a room. The one time I feel like he's truly clueless in this game is right here, right now. And Laura lies and locks the door behind you with a boss known as Flesh Lips. Now, this is where I recognize that the siren plays at the end of every boss fight when it finishes. I don't know what exactly that means, if someone could let me know, but it was something I did end up picking up on. Then, as he wakes from this boss fight, you hear a woman calling out for James. It looks like she's being wheeled down a hallway. But then when it wakes up from that perspective, it's James. So maybe he was seeing from Mary's perspective at one point in time when she was in the hospital. But this is where Maria will freak out with you later on in this level, saying that you didn't protect her. Like, you're supposed to take care of me. And she's upset that you didn't. And she becomes oddly determined to find Laura. She feels like she has to protect her. It's up to her to protect her, symbolizing that connection between Mary and Laura. Now afterwards, this is where Maria is killed by Pyramid Head, and you see Laura leaving the hospital soon after. I thought one of the most interesting parts of this scene when Maria dies is James leans his back against the elevator. He sits down. He puts his head down because he feels like he's let her down. He's let another person die, and obviously he sees a lot of Mary in her, so he starts to blame himself again. The guilt follows him again, and when the door opens he still keeps his back to the door and doesn't rush to get up, turn around. He doesn't get worried. It's almost like he's accepted that if something is here that will surprise me or kill me, I am fine with that. It is a very subtle detail. It's just my personal takeaway from it. I could be overthinking it, but that was telling me because in my head as a scaredy cat, I'd be like, yo, I'm facing the door. What's What happened just sucked, but I am not going down with you, Maria. But he just leans against the door, slides down, turns his back. It's a moment of brevity, brief brevity, um, where he just chills, goes over the fact that he's failed again. The door opens 
and he is not quick to get up. He's just welcoming death's sweet embrace. So you eventually leave the hospital after this. Now you're in the prison. Uh, this is where also you see for the first time heading to the prison that the fog has been replaced by the darkness. The nurses are in the streets. Uh, now here's where you start to see some of Eddie's character development. Now, if I were to make like a tier list, I got to say like Eddie falls lower for me. He's not a bad character by any means, but to me, Angela's actually, hmm, I'm not considering Laura. Laura's the bottom of the of the totem pole. Then you have Eddie. Then you have Angela. I, I really think Angela's character arc is super, super interesting. But this is where you see Eddie start to kind of play fun. Like, oh, I killed someone. It was fun. It was easy. All I had to do was point the gun at him. He goes bang like that. And James doesn't back down, doesn't get scared of him, kind of challenges him and goes, what are you talking about, Eddie? Did you kill this person? And he says, oh, he's joking. He claims he was dead when he got there and he kind of strolls on off. So you're starting to see now Eddie's character is shifting. He was being bullied by Laura. She called him fat. Um, you know, even James kind of to some extent was like, "You all you can do is sit around and eat pizza. Kind of funny, but still like poking at Eddie. And you can see now he's starting to have enough. And as he's trying to show some sense of bravado, like, look what I can do. And he's still challenged. It's this moment of how weak he truly is as a person. As he walks away and goes, I was just kidding anyway. You know, it. I like how they capture his character. He's just not in the most interesting to me. But this is probably the, I would say the worst stretch of the game. I don't like the prison. Uh, it wasn't particularly scary outside of the point where you're going through the cells and you hear like the, the mannequins and the straight jackets rather. Uh, they're like banging against the cells and walking around. You hear the radio going off fuzzing up you're thinking like oh boy oh boy here we go this is getting a little creepy now but otherwise i think the best part of the prison is that you find the hunting rifle here okay like that was the moment i went yes new weapon long range high damage this is what we're looking for no more using the two by four no more using the steel pipe we got an actual rifle here i like that but uh while it was creepy i just thought that the navigation was so confusing here so Emo confusing and this man starts jumping down a million holes which maybe is like diving in his own mental prison are we looking too deep into it now i don't know but this game's littered with symbolism i can't help but look at it eventually you find maria again after this puzzle behind some bars and she has no clue what you mean when you said that she died. She's like, are you confusing me with someone else? She brings up a videotape. She says, I'm your Maria if you want me to be. Um, it doesn't matter who I am. I'm here for you. Again, that symbolism of James's desires coming through here where she's leaning in the chair, spreading it all out, kind of welcoming him in when he finds her and that she'll make it worth his while. Now, when you do find her, she's dead as a door now. It's uh, not told to you who actually killed Maria, but she's dead again for the second time. He's like, who did this to you? Is this my fault again? Uh, so this is a trend occurring that the, the loop will continue. Mary will, or Maria shall always die. So this is where you hear in the labyrinth, a yell from a hallway. This one sent chills. Like this was the first chills moment because it was like, what is happening? So you walk in to this room, and this is where I feel the symbolism is most on the nose in this game, where they're clearly telling you what's going on. Uh, the name of this boss, which is, this is out of the game, but the name of this boss is Abstract Daddy, but the design of it looks like a bed with two bodies mushed together. You look around the room, it's very fleshy. You see a lot of holes, not to get too descriptive here, with the ins and outs, and what she is saying to this man. When you combine that, with a newspaper you read earlier about Thomas Orozco being stabbed a bunch of times and you see the blood tip knife that that Angela had in her hand earlier. It all comes together here when once you beat the daddy boss, she takes a TV and beats the life out of this thing, letting out a lot of pent up frustration, anger. And you're like, OK, I know what's happened to her, what she's going through and why she was so distrustful of like me, another dude, just being kind to her, being welcoming to her, just that natural distrust is there. It's particularly a standout here, and this is the most on the nose point, is when Angela suggests that you were here for one thing and you could just force her like her dad did. And you're like, okay, 
I see what she's trying to say here. And she eventually leaves saying that you didn't even want Mary around anymore. You wanted something else. And this is where her like distrust of men continues to crop up and fairly so. So now you make your way to the room where it's a graveyard. And this has all of the characters' names. I found it interesting when you saw even like Angela's name and you find your own name. And again, this is where I thought of the theory from the beginning of the game with the save system. And I went, okay, like, is James dead now? Like, are we walking to his own personal hell? Is that, like, as we dive deeper and deeper into these prisons and these holes in the floor, are we just diving deeper? Are we going literally to hell based off something we did? That's how I was starting to interpret it as you dove into your own grave. And it's through here that you eventually find Eddie. And again, you learn that he killed a bully's dog. He ran away. He was tired of being bullied. And you kill Eddie. This is a, a really key moment because James specifically points out, you know, it's his first human kill. But is it, James? Is it really now? Yeah, okay, your first, huh? This is what I love about this game's writing is you loop back around and you go, oh, they put that there because they knew this is foreshadowing. It was not his first kill. It was not his first taste of blood. And it's probably why he was capable of doing so without much question because he's done it before to someone who was closest to him. So now you're at the final stretch of the game. The Lakeview Hotel, what I think is the best area of the game exploration wise. And it says that Mary is waiting for you in room 312. That is the place you stayed in. That's your special place. And this makes sense that he's learning this now. Like, oh yeah, of course this room is it. Because as he's going through the fog of his mind and he's revealing his suppressed memories, he is starting to learn, okay, so this is where I was supposed to go this whole time. This was our special place. This is where we always went on vacation. This is where I promised I would take her back. Okay. It makes sense as he goes through it all and the revelations occur and he learns more about himself again that he now realizes this is where he has to go. So it's a pretty straightforward area. Laura's here too. She scared the life out of me here when she hit that piano. I guess there's a couple of jump scares, if you will, but they're not intentionally placed. It's more like, oh, I wasn't expecting to hear a loud piano out of nowhere. She gives you a letter and says not to tell Rachel, who is one of the nurses. And you never hear much about Rachel outside of this, just that she is someone who seemingly worked at the hospital. But the letter says that she wants to encourage she being Mary, uh, Laura, to give James a chance, even though he is surly, even though he's aggressive at times, that Mary actually wanted to adopt her if she had the chance. So, you know, Mary made two letters. She made one for James and one for Laura. This was that letter. So Laura wasn't lying the whole time that there was a letter. She just now wants to show it to you. Again, because Laura just serves to be annoying, it would seem. The... Interesting part of this area, gameplay-wise, is when you had to deposit all your stuff onto a bookshelf <laughs> and uh, go all the way down only to wrap around and come back up once you have the proper keys for everything. Uh, I like this because it's not too long-winded. I hate when video games take away your stuff. They punish you for making progress. I've just never understood that concept, but this game doesn't do that. It manages to just, you know, let you explore most of the game. You, you've worked hard to get your materials. And the one time they take them away, it's reasonable as there's a weight limit to the elevator and it's not too long-winded. And you actually get a bunch of stuff. So when you come full circle, it's this satisfying moment of, oh, I have all this stuff I just looted, plus all of this guns and ammo and stuff that I found back in the closet again. Too bad we have to leave. So it does bring you full circle. And here is where you see the videotape and you learn that she died, she being Mary, because she was killed by James. Laura says that she hates James once he tells her that. And then she hears Mary on the radio once more. Now the flashlight has stopped working. So I, I found this timing to be very interesting. But now you are in the other world and you're going to start teleporting all around the hotel as you open up different doors. And eventually you find Angela one last time, this time in a flaming staircase. The first time in the game you find any fire, Angela sees you. And like I said earlier, she's like, mama, I was looking for you before realizing it's you, James. And she believes that she deserves what happened. She starts to absorb her guilt, live in her guilt. And she asks for the knife once more because she's reliving that guilt. And as you refuse to take care of her because you're burdened by your own guilt, she walks away deeper into the fire, deeper into her own personal hell 
where James goes, it's hot as hell in here. Very interesting choice of words, by the way. It's hot as hell in here. And she goes, it's always like this for me, but it seems like you're just seeing this now. So like you're truly seeing Angela and her situation for what it actually is. Now you get to the pre-final boss in the game, double pyramid head, kills Maria again. Then James stands up and has his like brief heroic line of, you know, no more of this. I'm going to fight back. I'm done running away. But I love how they just don't ebb into the cliche. They just stay tactful enough where it's like, okay, don't turn James into a superhero. He's been a normal guy this whole playthrough. And it's exactly that. So you fight both pyramid heads. You kill them both. Or really, they kill themselves because you fought back against your guilt. Maria's out of the picture. You kind of have this clarity all at once of what you need to do. And so you go up to the final floor on the roof and you fight Mary. Mary, the person who's holding this guilt against you for what you did to her all those years ago. And you fight her, you kill her, and depending on how you handle Mary? the game, whether you took a lot of damage, whether you didn't take a lot of damage, and what was a kind of annoying boss fight, you get a certain ending. There's some funny endings like the UFO ending, the dog ending, all that stuff. But you fight this Mary boss, you beat her, and you learn that James wanted his life back, and Mary being dead would have really helped that. But Mary urges James, in the ending I got, to go on with his life. That she was angry she was going to die and struck out at James a lot. And eventually James stopped showing up to the hospital. And this was like, even reading it now, like, again, I talk about hypochondriac and just like, James. these two had a whole future planned out. And I just think about like how short and fleeting life is. And I think of how well this game captured it. Where like, even now just gives me almost like goosebumps. The heebie-jeebies like, oh, too unsettling for me. But it's a necessary emotional gut punch to really get the point of the game across here where she urges James to go on with his life. And then you see James and Laura going to visit her grave together. And it looks like they've accepted how things are happening. And I just got to say that uh, with that and the sub story ending where, um, you know, James had uh, found Maria, it's just a powerful, complete experience. I, I really, really love Silent Hill 2. You know, as you can tell, it's a six hour game, but there's so much to be said about it. So much that I spent this much time, at least in the raw recording, it's 50 plus minutes. I spent this much time talking about Final Fantasy 12, which is like a multi dozen hour JRPG with much more time to tell a story and get into the politics. And here I am saying as much about a survival horror game. So yeah, clearly a lot happens in this story. And you definitely, I think, have to play it twice or watch a, a, another video essay or two on it to truly digest all of the game displays to you. It's meant to be replayed, but I love the game. I am here for whatever they do in the future. And those are my thoughts on Silent Hill 2 after my first ever playthrough. Wonderful game. Absolutely recommend it if you can deal with those tank controls. With that, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for me. What do you think of Silent Hill 2? I leave it to you to fire away in the comments down below. Other than that, take great care of yourselves and I'll see you in the next Retro Rebound. Peace out.